This is an oral history program interview for the Institute for Latino Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Today is August 27th, 2007, and I am in Chicago with artist Paul Sierra. And Paul, thank you so much for agreeing to the interview for our program. And I'd like to ask you to begin with to state your full name, date, and place of birth. My legal name is Paulino Sierra. Everybody calls me Paul. This is Paul Sierra. And I was born July 30th, 1944, in Havana, Cuba. Thank you. Um, could you, when we start out these interviews, we usually ask the person to talk a little bit about their background, um, biographical information, where you grew up, um, what your early schooling was like, and maybe some of your early influences. I'm sure you can help me, you know, on the line, remind me of that. But I was born in Havana, as I said, 1944. Um, my father at that time was working um, in the legal system, the courts in Cuba. So we moved a couple of times. I, I believe I left uh, Havana, the whole family, my brother, mother, and father, when I was about one year old, and we went from one small town to another where my father worked in the courts. Um, then we went to a city about 75 miles from Havana called Matanzas, where I lived until I was 11, and then I returned to Havana, and I left when I was 15 years old. And um, your education while you were there? Um, the first couple of years, kindergarten and so on, um, I went to a public school. But at that time, um, my parents decided that um, it would be better if I go to a private school. I always was a terrible student. Um, uh, I didn't understand that I was dyslectic. And it was very difficult for me to uh, mathematics and uh, uh, remember things. Uh, so I was not the best student even when I was in high school. Uh, high school, of course, was all public high school, so mm -hmm. I was there until um, I finished high school, but I finished early. Mm -hmm. That was 15. F 15? Yes. And did you have an interest in art? Were you painting, drawing at that time? All the time. I, uh, I cannot remember being conscious of myself <coughs> without uh, remembering that I used to draw. You know, copy, I think, uh, from the comics, Donald Duck, uh, Willie Woodpecker, or stuff like that and my father was an avid reader and uh, he had a, a small library and among the books he had a whole collection of art books some of them were from the renaissance or the baroque uh, artists and uh, i always read them they were in english it was kind of difficult um, when i was a little kid but uh, i will always say uh, aware of rembrandt was and you know giotto and so on so that is the earliest that I can remember really understanding that uh, though I was doing drawing because it felt good, <coughs> there was something else besides beyond what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Out there. Out there. Yes. <laughs> and were you sort of were you aware of the political situation or how did that affect mm -hmm. when you were growing up or just before you left? Yes, uh, I, I um, my family, the whole family was a, a news junkie, just like I am, and uh, we were very much aware of uh, not just the revolution that had happened later on in the, in the 50s, uh, toward the end of the 50s against Batista, but uh, political turmoil was always there, and we used to listen to well, my parents, and I had to listen to uh, political programs and, you know, read magazines and newspaper and that. Yes, I was very much aware of it. So even at 15? Oh, even earlier than that. Yeah. You know, <coughs> I, I, I cannot remember <coughs> what uh, any day there was not a controversy about somebody stealing something in the government or, you know, yeah. the government falling because of corruption, but everybody was corrupt, I think. Yeah. Just like today. Just like today. <laughs> 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 um, and so then when you came to the U.S., as if that was in 1961. You were finished with high school. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
What was that like? Where did your family come? My father came first. Um, he was working. He worked both for the Batista government and Fidel Castro's government when he came to power. He was a bureaucrat. Mostly he worked in the banking, National Bank. My father was an attorney by then. And uh, he became aware that uh, Fidel Castro's government was going to develop into something else and that something else was not going to be very good. Um, he used to work for a few months uh, with Che Guevara, who was the president of the National Bank. Why he was made that, I don't know, because the man didn't know anything about you know, economics. But my, I think that helped my father to understand that things were going to go radically wrong. So he immigrated uh, like a couple of years before us, maybe a year and a half, and eventually the whole family, uh, my brother, my mother and I, we came to uh, Miami where my father was living, and we stayed in Miami for uh, a year and a half, I believe, maybe even less than that, and then we came to Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, you went to the Art Institute of Chicago. You studied mm -hmm. there during the during the '60s. So shortly after you came to Chicago, um, were there? Any professors or fellow students there that stick in your mind or that were a particular influence? Well, there were two teachers that actually they were married. Uh, Rufino Silva, he was from <coughs> Puerto Rico, and his wife, Yola Ragashi. Um, they were not just good teachers, uh, but they befriended me and uh, allowed me to, to visit them at their home where. They had a very large home in the north side, and uh, each one of them had a studio. And I was put in contact with actual artists, meaning them, that uh, worked every day in their own uh, art, and how they had set up mm -hmm. the studio, uh, how to go about building uh, stretchers and where you buy canvas and how expensive it was. And I became aware at that time that regardless how good of an artist they were, which they both were very good, uh, they had to subsidize their art, being be teachers at the other institute. And um, being a teacher was not just a matter of just giving three or four classes per week. They had uh, all kinds of uh, meetings and they had to be part of and so on. They were always complaining about how much time really working at the school was taken from them and you know I, don't, I won't say they were bitter about it because you know they had a family and they had to support that family but uh, it took a lot of energy and time from them. And could you tell, um, talk a little bit more about his wife? I'm not familiar with her. Yola um, came from Milwaukee and um, her family, I believe, was a family of Italian sculptors. She was in sculptors. And I said it was because I believe that both are, they passed away. I'm talking, you know, they were older at that time already. And uh, she was in a sculptors. And I believe she, you know, she taught also drawing uh, sculpt and art history at the Art Institute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was very mild, very nice lady. Uh, Rufino. <coughs> And Rufino was an Stalinist. He was very bitter. He was Puerto Rican and uh, he was a nationalist. And uh, he thought that the greatest man ever was Stalin. And you could not convince him that the Stalin had been a monster who killed 36 or more million of his own people. You know, he would listen to Radio Moscow every night. And um, he always was dreaming about the day that Puerto Rico would be independent. It says a lot about him that he uh, befriended me, that you know, even our political uh, opinions didn't agree at all. Mm -hmm. You know, even when I was young, I was I realized that <coughs> no great man is a good man. You know, and, and Stalin certainly was a very powerful man, but he was not a good man. Um, your first show, we were just looking at a clipping, mm -hmm. in, you know, 1968 here in Chicago, I want to just verify that's right, and how did you, 
How did you get to that point? How did that come about? Yeah. Well, um, it came to a, a point that I decided that the school, that institute, really was not going to make me what I wanted to be. I was a painter. So I quit. And um, I put together a whole group of uh, paintings and drawings. And I went around looking for a place where to show them. I, I thought that if I had a, a, a one-person show, um, it would be the beginning of a superb, you know, very wonderful career, you know. Um, so that was <laughs> very naive of me. So I got this small gallery in uh, what is now Lincoln Park, and um, I had my my first show, solo show. I invested whatever little money I had and made a, a postcard, which I don't have any left. I, I don't remember. But anyhow, I didn't sell one single uh, piece of art, not either a drawing or a painting, and I was just destroyed. So I, you know, I, there again, um, I, I hit the, the wall that says you have to learn a little bit more about this, just like in politics. Um, there is such a thing as the art world, and there is such a thing as the art industry. And just because you try to be honest, and you know, when you do your artwork and try not to follow, you know, um, any group of people, you try to be unique, whatever, that doesn't mean that you're going to sell. You know, selling uh, artwork is just like selling, you know, cars or airplanes or shoes. Has nothing to do with what happens in the studio. It's a harsh reality. <laughs> yes, it's a harsh reality, and the art industry is a very large industry. Uh, you know, um, you have the galleries, you get the museums, you get the uh, the art center, you have the, the people who make the paints, uh, the folks who make the canvas, um, you have the magazine, you have the artists, you know. And everybody has an agenda. And the agenda is, you know, that they have to have some money and they have to get a better job and they have, you know, the bills keep coming and you have to understand all that. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it is billions upon billions of dollars that the art um, industry brings to the country. Mm -hmm. And I, I was going to ask you about, you know, as I look at your history that in the 1980s you start showing up in these national shows um, and I guess we can segue into um, what what led up to those national shows that national recognition you were working um, outside of the art well not outside but mm -hmm. morning, um, yeah. you had a day job oh uh, yes painting and how did that uh, can you talk a little bit well about uh, after I had this first um show that was a disaster, <clears throat> a friend of mine, uh, you know, said, you know, I have, I know somebody who works in advertising and you know how to draw more or less, why don't you get a job in advertising? And until then I was, you know, working part time sometimes and cleaning tables and stuff like that. So I said, fine. And um, to my surprise, they gave me Goldblatt's. I don't know, I, it's no longer in business. Goldblatt's was a, a store chain here in Chicago and they used to sell everything you know, from spark plugs to bras you know. so um, they gave me a job in their advertising department and uh, cleaning the floors <laughs> another success yes it began but you know from the very bottom so um, eventually uh, it's not funny but uh, one of the art directors died and I went to uh, to the, the vice president of the department, says, you know, I came here hoping to, you know, to, to get to, to do some advertising and, you know, only clean the floor and filing stuff away. So I said, okay, well, we'll give you a chance so you don't have any training in advertising, which was true. So I did all right, so they allowed me to continue doing, uh, you know, newspaper ads and so on. So I, 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 that's how I began really truly to subsidize my artwork. Uh, for many years. Um, I would work during the day and I would paint every night and every weekend. And it was a terrible discipline and, and it took well, a big toil. 
More so when you are aware, even when you are young, that your best hours, the best energy, is gone. Yeah, after work. Yes, yes, you are very tired. More so, something that became more and more demanding with the years of like advertising. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was, I was having, uh, I was by the eighties, uh, something happened. It was a U.S. census came up with the latest number. And those numbers um, show that the Hispanic people in the USA will become, in a few years now they already are, the largest, the largest minority in the country. Then here is where the art industry comes into it. Oh, yeah. The industries and the, uh, and the politician, then they began to uh, have gestures, you know, toward the Hispanic uh, people in the USA, and one of those gestures <coughs> was this group of, as you can look at it, of those shows in the 1980s. And one of them was, for example, the Rockefeller Foundation, when you gave a lot of money, although it was Ford, although it was Budweiser. Oh, yeah. So you can see all the government and, you know, uh, the industry putting together the show. What happens is when you have a, a, that kind of backing, is that your shows get national attention, not just good museums, but national press. So Time Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, you know, all the magazines and television and so on, we're following all this. But if the art industry behaves in many ways like any other industry, it also is as fickle as the fashion industry, because it's always looking for something new. After the 1980s, you can see how these national big shows for Hispanics disappeared. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, one day I was working alone and I got a, I think it was a Saturday, I got a letter in the, in the mail, I got up and up, I was very curious because it was coming from the corporate gallery. Okay. Yeah, Washington D.C. and they said that they were two of their curators were putting together a show of thirty Hispanic artists in the USA, and um, there was going to be a great catalog and all this and all that. And they were interested in looking at my artwork. I just couldn't believe it, you know. I was just so eventually they show up and they picked up a few paintings, and I was in this huge show. Of 30, but we were 30 artists, and uh, it went all over the country, and it got tremendous response. And from then on, the the, the, uh, the sales, you know, of all these artists, and many of the other Hispanic artists, began to grow and grow and grow. For me, it came to a, a point that I was making as much money in the, selling my artwork as I was doing being a creative director at the agency. So, you know, I, I was still working because I, I, you know, I had a family and, you know, I had to pay mortgage and so on. But, but the moment that I began to um, make enough money, I quit advertising and that was 20 some years ago. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that show, that Hispanic art in the United States, that was one of the... Oh yes, absolutely. That was a tremendous impact. Yeah. Um, how do you think that they came across your, your work? Were you showing in galleries yes. at that time? So you were you working yes. in galleries? I, yes, I was showing in galleries. Uh, frankly, I don't remember which one it was. It was not Phyllis Kine. I went to Phyllis Kine after that. Um, I think it was called Wenda J or something like that. But uh, yes, they visited the galleries, and um, I think they asked opinions of from people local people, collectors, and so on, and, and eventually my name came up. Mm -hmm. um, are there, can you talk a little bit about some of the other artists and writers that you are, and that you've been in contact with, that you're friends with over the years, or any that stand out to you? Of the, uh, those shows, um, I have some that have passed away, like Carlos Alfonso, who passed away, you know, me. Several of them die, and you, I, I don't know if you remember that also it was the beginning of AIDS, oh, yeah. and um, it was a terrible thing. Um, others, uh, I know the one who died was Carlos Alma, 
in uh, LA. Well, certainly, I had kept in touch with Magu, who's mm-hmm. man. And. Um, so that show sort of started bringing artists. Oh, yes, we, 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 yes, we got to be pretty good like and the close person. people. Um, but eventually, you know, everybody has a life and uh, all kinds of pressures and so on. And um, I'll be all of them, the only ones that I have kept um, was Magu from the um, from the show, the 30 Hours, and another one from that group, but other, from other show was uh, Mario Bencomo, who was an artist in Miami. For that time, I was uh, you know, close to uh, um, Asaceta, Luis Cruz Asaceta. Uh, but now he lives in New Orleans. But anyways, yes, some of them I have kept in touch. And I have made new friends, you know, uh, here in Chicago. I'm pretty close to John Pimo Farb and uh, a French artist called Didier Nolet. We are close friends. Uh, Eladio Gonzalez, another Cuban artist, which should have been in those shows and he was not. You know, a lot of very private in so many crazy ways. But anyways, he uh, he was not, and I think he should have been. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Were there other Midwest artists in those shows, or were you? Were they mostly? West? I mean, can, if you if you can think about it, were they mostly? Um, most of the time, I was the only Midwestern. Um, I think that um, they didn't do. They didn't do a very good job trying to find Mexican Americans or you know Mexican artists living in the in the Midwest. Because um, there were some Eladio. Yes, of course. You know Eladio. Romero, Alejandro Romero, a yeah. good friend. You know he was here, of course. And um, I don't know if they visited their studios or not. I, I you know when these things happen, you you are happy for yourself. But there was another one now that you you know that used to live at the time in the Midwest, but he had moved away since then. Um, Roche, Arnaldo Roche, oh, yeah. and uh, we were good friends for a while. But again, you know, time and distance, you know, it's very difficult to. And we also involved in our own lives. It's mm-hmm. hard to keep. You know. mm-hmm. um, and did these people you? Uh, influence your work at all, or just you know? Kind of oh, absolutely! I, I I I think so. I um I think I I, I understood um that the Hispanic art didn't to be just about the race, about the politics of the group that. It could be about things that are important to any human being, you know, love and fear and so on, desire, whatever, love for nature, um, fear of what's going to happen to nature. Um, <clears throat> there were some artists like Magu who have kept their uh, interest all through the years uh, alive, and then the, the primary interest was about. The role of the of the Chicano artists in in, the, in society, um, and I admire him for that. In many ways, I'm a, a maybe a more selfish artist. Um, I had opportunities to move to Miami uh, to be among Cuban artists, and I I never had done that. So I like to be. More alone than anything else, you know. I, I don't get involved really in politics, or anything like that. And it, is, and it would be impossible to be a, a, a Cuban artist of my generation in, in Miami, uh, and I underline generation uh, without being in some kind of controversy. Yeah. And uh, controversies are here and gone, or you know. Art is forever, more or less, I hope. And you make your art. I, I read where you wrote to someone that you make your art for you. You have to. Um, yes. You just yeah, right. 
you, it, when the moment that you are doing it, you try to be as honest as it's pure as Caesar's wife. I don't know if Caesar's wife was a pure or even Caesar, but you know, I, I, at least I try to, to put away the, you know, you know what, how much money I have to pay in bills and so on and so on. I try to, you know, to work with several ideas that I have, and uh, if they sell, fine. If they don't sell, not so fine. Mario Vincom was in town, in the most possible town. He has never taken a shot with a digital camera. And uh, he's, I'm, I'm helping him take shots with a digital camera. Who? Mario Vincomo. Oh. Um, since we started talking a little bit about identity and, you know, Chicano artists mm -hmm. looking for that, um, <coughs> how do you feel about the identity issue as it relates to your your art. I've, I've seen references to you as Cuban exile, Latino artist, Hispanic artist, an artist with Latin American roots. Um, how do you see yourself and how do you see these, I'll say labels, that people put on mm -hmm. art? Well, we are all uh, influenced by our background, there's no, no doubt about it. Um, and, and we make choices of uh, style and, you know, <clears throat> when it comes to art, producing art. Um, but I don't come to the studio and say, I'm going to make a great Cuban painting today. Or, you know, I'll try to. Um, I go about trying to do as best as I can. Uh, it may be that, you know, early paintings were more so about my Hispanic heritage. But I'm going to spend. 15 years in Cuba, and now I'm going on 63, and the rest of those years, uh, I still am bad with mathematics, otherwise I would tell you. Uh, the rest of those years, well, I have been uh, lived in North America. How can I deny that? You know. Um, so, I'm, I'm, I, this is somebody's looking for their roots and want to keep them alive and so on. <clears throat> um, that is fine. Uh, one time I read Dante, I think, but I think I have mentioned it to you, was that Dante said that, that an exile walks forward, but his head is always looking to the past, backwards, you know. I'm an immigrant, and I propose to you that an immigrant walks forward and looks forward. It has to. Yeah. So, I'm an immigrant who has lived most of my life in the Midwest of the United States. Um, when I go to, uh, to the tropics, I suffer a lot with the heat now, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I long for, uh, for the cool weather of the United States and the North of the United States. Do I am interested in, in Latin American culture? Absolutely. I read as much as I can about it. Um, Cuban writers, uh, Mexican, you know, Argentine, and so on. I also read French, you know, uh, authors. But yeah, you know, I'm. You know, one thing that is interesting is what makes you a foreigner. It is not your views, but your accent. Oh, I thought you were going to say is how other people view you, but you're, yeah, your accent. <coughs> so if I go to a gas station, let's say in Wisconsin, I'm lost, and I walk up to the lady and I say, "Could you help me, please? I'm lost." Her first look at me is not a tourist loss, but this guy has an accent. And I maybe, you know, I, I can read it now. And then I try to speak very slowly, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's not my ideas or my images that for most people it makes me a foreigner. Right. But it, it is my name, or my last name, and, and my accent. 
and that doesn't come onto your canvases. <laughs> Fortunately, the painting then doesn't the painting doesn't care about it at all. I read something else recently. Um, you know, someone describing your work as exile art, or fantastic in that realm. But then also some a, a, a curator relating it to the Hudson River School, the landscape school. And I thought that was very interesting. <coughs> you know, sort of serene, romanticized landscapes. And so I'm looking at this one here, it doesn't. Well, we are. I, I think we are <coughs> all victims of our history. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, for somebody like myself who likes to read and, and, and look at uh, artwork, uh, I have a lot of influence. Uh, not to call it stealing. <coughs> I don't believe in uh, you know creating the wheel all over again. I think that the, uh, for example, the Hudson River School, uh, they have. Um, a love for God and God expresses herself in, <laughs> in, in, the, in the beauty of, and the majestic uh, way that the painters portray nature. <clears throat> it was a, a historical moment for the United States, the opening of the West and so on. So if, if you want to um, express that um, overwhelming feeling for nature, though I don't believe in God, you can find that in the, in the Hudson School, you know. But it was not as an, uh, as an important um, school, at least for me, as surrealism was. Mm -hmm. I was, surrealism was for all Latin America. I think that most Latin American artists until, uh, I would say, the 70s and so on, the 80s, minimalism really began to, to take over, um, were very much uh, surrealist in roots. You know, that, that impact didn't happen in North America, where abstract was really received, maybe, you know, I don't know, because it was more to, to their liking, to the, the spirit of the, the German, Irish people, you know. But surrealism, I think, goes very well in Latin America, uh, not just in painting, but in writing, too. Mm -hmm. So I view that uh, as, as a more important. Also, um, as a style and combination of colors, I think Impressionism mm -hmm. uh, is, is extremely important to me. Mm -hmm. you know, palette. I love color. <clears throat> I, I cannot conceive, for example, I could never have done like uh, Franz Klein in the New York school could have done, say, I'm going to make a painting where the background is going to be white and the gesture is just going to be black. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it is impossible and then, you know, to, to resign you know, to all the other colors. It's just impossible for me. Your hands would be tied. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I want to go back for a minute to talk about, you know, this art world that, that you touched on a little bit. It, you know, you. It seems you have very successfully negotiated that that art world um, with commercial galleries, national recognition. Um, academic art galleries, museums. Um, how do you think? Um, what ad what advice, I guess, would you have for young artists, or do you have a philosophy about this? That well, I left school a long, long time ago, so I don't know how <coughs> how they um, prepare. I hope they do a better job prepare their students when they graduate uh, to to go and face the world. I, I bet that most people who follow uh, art after graduating um, have to go and find a teaching job. And of course, nobody told me that, uh, and I doubt it that they would tell because how many teaching jobs are there? You know, 
it was fortuitous for me that I went into advertising because advertising is coupled with uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. And marketing has to be to understand who and what you're selling. Who is your market and what is it that you're selling to them? Mm -hmm. Who is a collector? You know. Well, most collectors have to be wealthy. You know that all the wealthy are collectors because you know there are very few collectors in the whole country. More people collect beer cans than collect paintings. So you can see the problem there. We have this huge, you know, uh, art schools that produce, you know, all these artists, and then what? What are they going to do? Well, not my problem anymore. But I understood very clearly that the the galleries are not going to solve my problems. That was obvious in, in my first show. That most galleries are small business that in order to survive have to have 30, 40 artists. And then that becomes obvious that these galleries can do, no, do nothing for you, except maybe every two years or so give you a solo show. Maybe. You know. Just to survive, you know, they struggle. And that goes for 99.9% .9 of all the galleries. So, I, the, 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 the galleries are only one component and on the sales force, if you want to call it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, the artist, have to be the, the main salesman, which is very difficult because you have to wear two hats. Remember, we have to supposed to be as pure as Caesar's wife. Well. You know, a problem here. Mm -hmm. So what I maybe I'm not answering your, your your question correctly. What I did is I I quit trying to to, to show after uh, my first show. I for, for I think it was for ten years or so I didn't show, but I worked and worked trying to get a style going and several ideas going because what the public wants and, the, and therefore the gallery owner is to have in, in his her hands a product that they can put a label on and that it is it has a style that you can recognize one after the other. So I put together like 30 uh, works <coughs> and I went to, to looking for um, academic places to show. I didn't want to go to the gallery again and beg because I didn't have a resume. You know, it's a chicken and the egg yeah, problem. Sure. So the only way to solve that problem was to go to the academics, you know, university, colleges and so on, and <clears throat> try to get a show, a solo show, group show, so on and so on, and build a resume, at least one page, and then go to the gallery with a, what I would call a more mature uh, body of work. And then to understand that once you get a gallery in town, in, it, in your hometown, you have then used that as a stepping stone to get other galleries in other cities, New York, Los Angeles, Houston, whatever you want, Miami. And that's what I did. And then I kept producing work and uh, having as much as many shows as possible. The galleries sold work, but I sold more than they did. You as the artist? Yes. As working? As yes. Your... I understood that each show had to have, if it is not possible to have a brochure, at least a nice, good uh, uh, postcard that a million list is all important that you have to collect that. The biggest change in all this <coughs> has been the internet. <coughs> the internet had made the, the galleries no as important as they used to be. Now you can present your work if that's what you want to thousands of people you know every month. That doesn't imply a sale of course for, for selling, you have also to collect uh, email addresses of collectors, 
of people who possibly will collect, meaning they have good jobs and so on. Mm -hmm. Doctors, lawyers, you know, CEOs, whatever. <coughs> and then, you know, as a selling tool, now you have your website. So you have to keep your web website changing enough to be able to send uh, a card, a mailing, you know, saying, ah, come and take a look at, at again to my mailing, uh, to my uh, website, uh, having some changes and so on. Again, it's a tool just like a, a gallery is. And it's marketing. It is marketing. Um, with the years, you begin to change yourself and you, I guess it's human change, you don't, you become less and less aggressive. At 63, I'm not as aggressive as I was at 33. Um, my paintings are not as uh, demanding because maybe I'm not as angry. You know, maybe I'm not as demanding. Um, fortunate, my um, expenses have gone down, but my prices have gone up. And uh, I'm up to a point the galleries tend now to be more of a problem to me than anything else. You know, and uh, again, the internet really can make a change and, uh, for the artist. Um, so you have more independence in a sense? It's absolutely. Mean, yeah. uh, so much that many artists, when they go out and, and, and are accepted by a, a gallery, the gallery makes a point to tell them that you cannot sell to your internet website. Though a gallery may have just a radius of uh, 175 miles of sales around the city, I said Chicago, you know, why would a Chicago gallery tell you you cannot sell, sell through your website to somebody who lives in Colorado? That's not fair. But that's what, a, you know, that's what a good impact for the artist and a bad impact for the galleries to have the, uh, the internet. There you go. <laughs> um, why do you paint? And you just said something about um, about um, you're not as angry. And mm -hmm. has, has the reason or why you paint, why you must paint, has it changed over the years? I guess I'll add that to my question. Or is it all okay, I guess so. In certain ways, it has. Uh, what I, I said that when I was a child, I I painted because I felt good and and and. I knew I was better at drawing than I was at mathematics, which I was, you know, terrible. Um, so I felt good. Uh, people said, oh, that's nice. You know, they sort of patted you in the head, and we all like that. When I grew up, I think it was um, in order to express um, what I thought I had to say or to imitate. Uh, artists or celebrities, you know, maybe I just wanted to be a star like everybody else. I wanted people to say, oh, that's a wonderful painting. Oh, look at the color palette. Oh, wonderful, you know. But eventually, it, it, it has become the reason for staying alive, a center to life. And all the changes that go around me, you know, in relations, um, friends, family, and so on. People come and go, die. Painting has always been something that I can depend upon. You know, it's almost like a force. It's almost like a place to run to. You know, so it's beyond something that feels good. It's beyond something that it, it, it make, makes me a living. It is. Is part of my personality. Yeah, can't, you can't, couldn't separate it. Right, correct. Um, is there any question I haven't asked you that I should have? I thought about that, and um, I had to go local in my answer uh, as far as uh, the city of Chicago. Um, the city of Chicago. Uh, does very well for um, theater, 
you believe it, for a ballet of folks, which is great, you know, we all like to go to the theater and enjoy it, you know. But I, I, in my opinion, does very poorly for the visual artists. We have, you know, large, good, I would say, uh, schools, not just in Chicago, in the Midwest, but we don't make it possible for them after they leave school to stay around. You know, um, there are many empty buildings all around Chicago. They once upon a time had a light industry. They're perfect, perfect for, uh, for studios. Uh, and nothing is done. Uh, there's all kinds of problems, you know, trying to get uh, a studio space for artists. Uh, supplies are very expensive, you know. Part of all this is fault of the of the artists and the industry itself, so, you know. Um, the artists. Yes, um, they don't know how to manage uh, the politicians. I believe that the folks in the uh, in the theater they do. You see, theater. When you have a theater, you have a board of directors, and to that board of directors, you try to get people who are captains of industry and politicians or, or their mates, whatever. And that assures you money and clout. Right. Connections. An artist doesn't think like that. It's an individual. Mm -hmm. You know. And it is a competitive, a very competitive field between, you know. It's very hard to have a two artists, for example, that share collectors. Though I'm close to to several artists, you know, I don't know their collectors. And frankly, they don't know mine. Mm -hmm. you know, that is not what happens with actors. That is not what happens with dancers. Mm -hmm. So, though the city of Chicago gets all kinds of money out of the art industry, visual art industry, you know, just take one, the Art Institute or NCA, you know, they do very little for the living artists. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Ed Paschke, the Art Institute owns 12 paintings by Ed Paschke. You go there, you won't see none. You know. When was the last time you saw a Chicago artist having a major show? Yeah. This has been a long standing issue, hasn't it? I, mean, I remember yes. reading. Yes. Chicago, the second city. Why is New York and LA? Why? Well, it's, 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 what's the difference? This is a very political town, and any agency that, that politicians can get hold of and use it as a tool for power, they will. And the the agency, for example, that uh, percentage for the arts in the city, mm -hmm. uh, public arts. All these are tools and for the politicians to play with. And they don't want neither the artists nor the public involved. So mm -hmm. a few weeks ago there was a big problem, you know, they hit the newspapers and there were manifestations of our group group of artists getting in front of the city hall. Of course we were, we were only were like fifty of us, you know, but it got in the newspaper. You know, the, um, the city uh, Department of Cultural Affairs had decided that th they didn't want the public participation in how they go about uh, giving and selecting artists, giving money and selecting oh, the artists. Grants, with their grants program? Yeah. And, and you can see how, for example, take the Millennium Park, which is one of the big attractions now in the city, it costs over half a billion dollars. But if you see all the artwork, which is, is the core of, of the Millennium Park, there is not a, and not just a Chicago artist, there is not an American artist. Mm -hmm. you know. And the reason for that is there are English and Spanish artists there, is because the, the, the Britain, Britain and Spain spend a lot of money and effort and you're promoting their art and their artists. They know it's a, it's a big industry and it will make a lot of money for them. The city of Chicago 
and the, the federal government doesn't seem to understand this, or maybe they just don't care. Yeah, it's just cultural. <laughs> yeah. That reminded me, when we talked before, you had mentioned that, that you've been a member of the Chicago Artists Coalition. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, can you talk a little bit about that group? Or? Well, <coughs> I think that it is the largest um, lobbying uh, group for artists, visual artists. Uh, I, th I always thought that a newsletter, and now they have, besides the newsletter, they have written in, uh, in electronic form in the internet. Uh, always was a very uh, important help for me. Um, it helped at the beginning to find venues where to show academic venues, um, non for profit. And uh, that really was a tremendous help. Um, now, with the internet, um, finding a space to do a reasonable job with that. There are not many spaces in Chicago for artists. So I always tell my friends or uh, young artists that uh, they should be members of the CDC. Um, I think that it, they have done a good job. So but of course, like everything else, it could be better. So logistical assistance, but also active? Yes. Yeah, recommendations about gallery, how to go about, you know, uh, interviewing for, you know, a place in the gallery and so on. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's, it's a positive force in Chicago for mm -hmm. us. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure.